Well, let's uh, open up word of, word of prayer. Brother Mark, will you open us up with prayer? Sure. Father God, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Holy Spirit, bringing to you our prayer requests for our congregation here. The uh, group of your believers, your church, that we ask that uh, you uh, give us special guidance during these times of change. And we look forward to uh, the new future that you have for us. That's, uh, we just have faith in you that it'll be brighter yet. Uh, and we bring to you our concerns over the COVID and um, looking toward uh, maybe a, a different a different time where um, we're not ruled by emotions and uh, the political triggers of the day that uh, we hold our faith in you and we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and look at it and pray that uh, your holy spirit will guide us and how we are to teach it to our classes this sunday for we do ask it in your son's name amen amen so this week's lesson is entitled Hey, go. Let me let me admit Brother Terry. Admit him in there. Hey, Terry. Yeah, he, there he is. All right. Hey, Brother Terry, you doing all right? He's probably got you on mute. He, he mutes himself. Does he? Yeah. It takes him a little while to unmute. Terry Price is connecting to audio and can't hear you yet. <laughs> that would be me. It'd be a little circle going on there if I tried to do it. All right. Can you can you hear me? I don't know why I'm not hearing you though. Let's see here. Well, maybe you're on mute. Maybe I am. <laughs> no, I shouldn't be. Let's see here. Let's see here. That's to unmute. I'm trying to. There we go. I can hear you now. Okay, we we I unmuted. I think. Okay, we're good. Awesome. Well, good deal. Tonight we're looking at. Um, Session 10, Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. And um, the three titles, uh, the three sections is hope demonstrated, forgiveness granted, uh, and then praise offered. And um, Brother Terry, did, uh, did you get a text message from me with the notes in it? I don't think so. I, did, I didn't see it. All right, I'll, 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 play with that. Um, I'll play with that. I don't have Word on my computer, so I'm, I'll, I've got uh, pages, and uh, so I had to save it as a Word document, and then I also had to save it. I went ahead and saved it as a PDF. I'll get your phone number after this. That way I can text that to you as well. Yeah, I was going to say if you... Uh, email it to you? Well, you can email, or you can you do it, but I was going to say as far as Word goes... You can download that to your phone now. Word to your phone? I have it online because I use pages all the time. Okay. On my iPad. And right. Whatever. But uh, yeah, you can you can get Word on that now. Okay. We're good to do. Unlike an iPhone. So. All right. Well, I'll uh, let's see here, Brother Terry. Let me see if I can send that to you. Um, let's see, Blake Prater, where'd I send that to myself? Master Blake, one file. You're going to do an email? I can email it to you. Now, yours was uh, Terry. L. Price at LSouth.net. Price at South.net. Oop, misspelled Bell South. <laughs> so, UTH.net. All right. There you go. I just emailed it to you. So you can have that. And I'll, well, you've got a physical copy with you there. Yeah. So 
Um, we're looking at uh, the first part as we look at this, it's the, it, the title of the lesson is Forgives. My, my favorite thing to use when I'm teaching is this uh, quick source book. Um, I really enjoy it. It's, it's really simple. Now I also use the big teacher book as well. In the big teacher book, I've got, I don't think we've got any CSB. I think they're all KJVs. So it gives me two different perspectives of the verse. That's the CSB and that's KJV. And then everything I do is New King James. I like New King James personally the best, but to each their own, just about, just about. Not all of them are the same. <laughs> Not all translations are created equal. Uh, so we are looking at that there in Luke 5, 17 through 26. Uh, the first portion is hope demonstrated. And just some key words that I've got here in the text that I sent to y'all, that y'all have a copy of in front of you here. And then uh, what I emailed Brother Terry there uh, is uh, teachers, Pharisees and teachers of the law. The Pharisees, um, some of this is common sense stuff. You know, it's pretty easy. Uh, but it says that they were the Jewish religious leaders. Pharisees were the Jewish teachers, while the teachers of the law were the scribes, uh, those formerly trained in Mosaic law. And what I thought this was interesting in the book where it says on one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. We'll stop there for a second. But it says there, and it, um, Jesus was not teaching in the temple. He was actually at Peter's house. Mark 2, 1 um, gives us that reference. And uh Peter's house is also considered to be where Jesus would reside when he was in Capernaum, which I thought was pretty interesting. Some of the things there that, that I read and it filled out. And then it tells us about Jerusalem and where they were in Capernaum. Jerusalem was about 85 miles from, um, it was about 85 miles from Jerusalem and Capernaum. There was a dis difference there. So these Pharisees that came out to hear Jesus speak, uh, they were intentional on hearing Jesus speak. This wasn't just like, oh, we just happenstance came upon Jesus' teaching, so we want to hear what he had to say. No, they absolutely knew of Jesus. Uh, they knew about, um, they, they, they had heard of him. His, his renown and influence had gone out, so they had, they had definitely heard about him, so they wanted to come in there and check and see what he was saying. And then um, another interesting point there, in the text was, um, it says, uh, let's see where I wrote that down. The Lord's power to heal was in him. <clears throat> now the, the, the power to heal was always in Jesus, right? Uh -huh. I mean, he could always heal. It wasn't like, oh, there was moments where he could or could not heal, like he did not have the power. But the problem, the issue is, is when you go back and you look at Luke chapter four, uh, you can see where Jesus said, you know, a prophet is not honored in his own town, and he was not able to do as many miracles as he would have liked to have done because of their lack of faith. So here in Capernaum, he was able to. It says, I know this could be noted due to his mentioning in Luke 4 about not being honored in his hometown, and he didn't perform any miracles there. You know, and in, in, in my take, a lot of times for people, like say, for example, for me as a minister, uh, in my hometown, you know, some people might not see me as someone who's been called by God to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, now don't get me wrong. I grew up, my mom and dad were both um, godly people. They loved the Lord. They served in the church and all that kind of stuff. But regardless of their, um, their faith, that does not translate that it has to be my faith. So Jesus being born and raised there in, in that area, um, he was not honored there. So he, he would not do as much. When we get through this section, we'll go back and we'll see if there's, if there's anything you'd like to add. I think I'd, I'd love to hear what you got to say. Uh, it says a man paralyzed uh, in the CSB, in the King James Version, it says stricken with palsy. Uh, and this is a familiar passage. We, we all are quite familiar with this. Um, the passage of the dedicated and faithful friends. You know, a lot of times I, I think people say this is the story of the paralytic. I think it should be called the, the story of the faithful friends, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, those that had much faith, um, because what they did, when we believe that Jesus can do what only Jesus can do, we will do things only explained by faith and obedience. Um, 
as I was studying it, you know, I, I, I preached a series with the students when Jesus does what only Jesus can do. And, uh, and talked about that with them. Well, this is one of those, matter of fact, this is one of the sermons I preached to them uh, about the paralytic. You know, what Jesus does, what only Jesus can do. And then uh, uh, one of the other interesting, I, I like when I read through here and reading these commentaries and bouncing them off one another, it, the titling, like this one said roof tiles in the CSB. It says, um, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. And the, the King James Version says, let's see, where's that at? Um, and when they could not find their way in that they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetops and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. That's, that's interesting, his couch. And then over here, they, uh, they say stretcher. <laughs> you know, for us today, when we think of a, um, a couch, we think of like a, like a big heavy couch. I mean, I move mm -hmm. on Fridays, I move furniture for DTL. When I think about moving a couch, I'm like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in today people got them electronic couches and jokers are heavy but uh, anyway this was a stretcher and they moved the tiles and as it says there on your on mm -hmm. your sheets uh, I thought this was an interesting tidbit when we realized that those who were financially better off had tiled roofs mm -hmm. and I, I didn't realize that um, Peter as a commercial fisherman seems to have done well through his trade mm -hmm. and used it for the gospel to be proclaimed so Everybody in the United States is, is rich, compared, comparative to the world standards. Everybody is. If you've got a roof over your house, if you've got a car, you're rich in, in the world standards. But, but over there at that time, to have a tiled roof was a big deal. Mm -hmm. and, and he was using his, his home to be a central location for the gospel to be proclaimed. And I think for us, we can see that this is a statement to us that is as people who have homes, <laughs> you know, which most people do, but not, not everybody, but most people, um, we should be taking the opportunity for our homes to be central locations for the gospel to go forth. You know, people shouldn't hear hollering and screaming and all <laughs> kind of craziness. They should be hearing, unless we're shouting for joy about Jesus, you know, <laughs> uh, singing songs of praise, but um, our homes should be central hubs of the gospel. So what do we take from these verses? What do we take from verses 17 through 19? Uh, three things I noted. We can see the influence and impact of Jesus to all <laughs> socioeconomic types of people. I mean, you got the Pharisees and you got the, you got the, uh, the, the teachers of the law. You've got the, the just the everyday people that were there, that had crowded into the home and outside the home into the overflow. And then you had the paralytic. It was brought in. It's all different types of people at different standards of life. And Jesus has influence and impact on all of them, mm -hmm. bringing them from 85 miles away, um, people that were there in the city. And we don't know how far out people had trickled in to hear Jesus speak. And then the paralytic to be lowered through a roof. It's a, it's a big deal to me when I think about that. And we can see the compassion of the friends of the paralytic. You know, they could have been, they could have just been soaked up in, in, the, in the draw of Jesus and um, just, uh, just stayed there with him and not thought about their friend, but they're very compassionate. They're like, hey, we, we've heard about Jesus. We need to go get him and bring, bring our friend back. Well, and they couldn't just look and say, well, it's too crap. We can't get you in. Yeah. We'll try later. That's right. <laughs> and who knows if later would ever come. Well, exactly. Yeah. So and I think one of the lessons there is, is with his friends was, is that um, when you have the opportunity to bring someone to Jesus, it's now, it's That's not right. later. That's right. We That's can't right. put it off till later. Mm -hmm. Obedience. There doesn't need to be any hesitancy in our obedience. Right. And I think I've got that written in here uh, some, or maybe that was in my lesson tonight with the youth. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting both of them run together a little bit here. Um, and then the last thing I wrote is we can see the dedication and faith of the friends of the paralytic. And Jesus is going to speak more to that faith. Terry, Brother Terry, is there anything you can add? Not really. Uh, you were talking about uh, Peter, obviously, lived in a nice house. I read a while back that uh, I think it was James and John, somewhere it's referenced in the New Testament. They had, they had servants. So being a fisherman was not necessarily a, 
yeah. a bad job to have, even though it wasn't well received by um, a, a lot of the people. Right. I think the yeah. Romans kind of looked down on it. And that's the reason why there's such a, almost like a negative kind of connotation to that, to that uh, occupation. Because yeah. the Romans may have seen that as something negative. So culture said that there was something negative to it. I mean, uh, well, it's we, going to be smelly and stinky. Well, yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah. yeah. So you can always tell when someone's been out fishing if they've actually been out fishing. It's, it's not. It's not a clean. <laughs> not a clean scale. That's right. Brogan loves to fish, and I and I'm not a big fisherman. Not not. I like spending time on the water or by the water, but it's just not one of my favorite things to do. But I can always tell when when you know he's got stuff underneath his fingernails from digging those worms out of the. <laughs> Now, I know those guys were legit. They had something to really do, you know, but digging them out of that little styrofoam cup to get those worms out and oozing all over your fingers. Anyway, so well, let's look at the second part. Forgiveness granted. This is verses 20 through 24. Um, Luke notes here, he says, seeing their faith, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I, I think their faith is a very big part of, of something to focus on this Sunday. Jesus saw and noted the friend's faith as the paralytic was presented before him. Jesus, this, this was huge to me. Jesus sees the entire circumstances situation, not just the immediate focus of the event. Um, so many times we think that just what's gonna be before our eyes is what we need to focus on. Sometimes you gotta take in the whole picture. And I think Jesus, he, he, he said, seeing their faith, those guys that were lowering down their friend. Um, I, I thought that was pretty cool. And one thing that they they highlight here in the quick in the quick source book is the word blasphemies. Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? He can say that your sins are forgiven. Uh, only God alone can do that. And so blasphemies, uh, the Hebrew concept of blasphemy. Uh, involved using the name of God in an unholy way or show contempt toward God. It was also involved, and this is where I think they, they were call, calling him for blasphemy. It also involved assuming a right that belongs only to God. And so apart from a physical miracle, the Pharisees assumed Jesus was using a right that belonged to God. So Jew, and, and Jews, as Paul noted in 1 Corinthians 1.22, Jews were always looking for a sign to confirm things. <laughs> uh, I quoted that there. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. Uh, so uh, there, there was blasphemy. They were saying, "Oh, this, look at these blasphemies!" And then God alone. The Pharisees were well informed of the Old Testament, but were not ready to see the New Testament developing before them. Uh, they knew only God could forgive sins, but were blind to the Jesus, uh, or were blinded to Jesus being. I should have taken that word "the" out but we're blinded to Jesus being God incarnate right before them. Of course, we it, it's hard for us to blame the Pharisees. You know, I believe if we were there in that same context, I don't know if we would even recognize it, you know? I would love to say that I would be big enough and, and spiritually prepared enough by God to say, hey, I'm this has got to be the Lord. This has got to be the Messiah. Or would I be one of those that has been in this position so long and I'd be like, I'd be scared to give up my you know, give up my authority and give up, you know, my credentials and my notoriety, if you will, for God to really come in flesh. Sure. You know, I mean, I think that's a big challenge that the Pharisees had in, in dealing with Jesus. Yeah, when you think about those that will be left behind after the rapture, there won't be, there won't be a, a few pastors. Yeah. There'll be a lot. There'll be a lot. Just be. like there'll be a lot of other people that will have thought, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I served on committees. Mm -hmm. you know, I was a deacon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then he goes on to say mm -hmm. there uh, in verse 22, but perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, pick up your bed, and walk. Pick up your bed and go home. Um, so as we, as we read through that, we see perceiving their thoughts. Um, I found this, as I read, things just like stand out to me. Uh, people. 
I don't know how other people study the word of God, but there's little things that just grab me when perceiving their thoughts. And then Luke writes it down like before, like, because let me just read what I typed here. The recorded words of the Pharisees were not noted only, they were not noted only because Jesus quoted what was in their minds and hearts. Jesus knew what they were thinking and in doing so spoke their doubts aloud. So what I'm saying is like, say, whatever you're thinking right now, I can't tell you what that is. I'm not God. But God said it to them. So Luke wrote down their thoughts. Can you imagine how scary that would be? To know that if I was in the presence of God, God would speak my thoughts aloud, whether it be in doubt or in faith, what's going through my mind, and then someone write it out. That's a big deal. That's a tenfold answer. <laughs> that's a tenfold <laughs> answer. <point. laughs> but that's, that's, Luke writes, yeah, yeah. Jesus, Jesus says, it says, perceiving their thoughts or perceiving what was in their mind, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? And, and, and what he's, you know, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They had not spoken that audibly yet, but God perceived it in their hearts. And he's, Jesus spoke it loud. Mm -hmm. That is just astounding. This blows my mind. Anything else I want to share on that? Okay. He says, and, and then to close out this section in verse, uh, there at the conclusion of verse 24, it says, uh, Luke records, I tell you. Jesus doesn't say, get up, take your bed. He says, I tell you. Let's see what it says um, in the King James. In the King James, it says, I say unto thee. He directs his command unto the, the paralytic. He is very pointed. And I mean, you think about when Jesus spoke to Lazarus, mm -hmm. he says, Lazarus, come forth. He was very mm -hmm. pointed with that. If not, I've heard it said, everybody out of the grave would have got up. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, because yeah. of the authority. Yeah. Um, I typed it down here in the notes. Jesus speaks with authority over all creation. And when he spoke directly to the paralyzed man, when, uh, and when he spoke directly to the paralyzed man, whatever, whatever Jesus was about to say, was about to come to fruition. Whatever it was he was about to say was about to come to fruition. Jesus spoke to the ailment of the paralytic and he responded with obedience and was healed. He says, I say to thee in the King James, he says, I tell you in the CSB, <laughs> get up, take up your bed, stretcher, couch, <laughs> and go home. And what did he do? He obeyed. And upon his obedience, and because the faith healed him, but upon he hadn't gotten up yet. No, you know Jesus had already forgiven his sins. But Jesus, is like, all right, all you Pharisees and Jews, y'all don't want a sign. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to get get up, take up your bed, and walk? All right, dude, just to prove that I've forgiven your sins, pick up your bed and go home. Yeah. And the guy gets up, picks up his bed, and goes home. And then, and then we get into the, the last section there where it says praise offered. Well, and if you stop and you think about it, I mean, here he is. He just healed a man that had been paralyzed for how ever long. Yeah. So that man is not going to have the muscle or capability to be able to pick up his bed because his bed right. was more than sheets and a pillow. Yeah. So when he healed him, he healed all of him. You know, which meant that his muscles are now now were usable. They were not atrophied anymore. They were not atrophied. He could he could use them. So that was quite a miracle when you think about it. <laughs> it's a huge you know, miracle. and then for that man to turn around and pick up his, you know, I like the way you put it, a couch. Yeah. You know, and even if it's a stretcher, that's still something that would be difficult for somebody that had been bedridden all this time. Yeah, could you, could you imagine the crowd was so large? Remember, the crowd was so large, they couldn't get through the door. Yeah. Now, when he said, pick up your couch, pick up your stretcher and go home, he didn't pick it up and somebody pull him back through the roof. He choked it up on his shoulder, strapped it to his back. I don't know exactly what he did, but that thing had to be large. He was laying on mm -hmm. it. And then people had to be able to tote it. And then he makes his way through the crowd and gets out the door. I mean, 
if if you were there, there is no way you could argue that miracle. Oh, no. No way. I mean, I think back there was a young man at Sanford. If if Sanford were watching, Sanford's son Craig Hendon. Craig's muscles in his legs did not develop as they should when he was young. Craig had very skinny legs. But I'm going to tell you, that boy's upper body strength was out of this world. I saw him race kids on his hands. They were on his feet. They were on their feet. <laughs> he was on his hands. I watched Craig uh, come close to outrunning boys on their, they were on their feet. He was on his hands out there on the road behind the youth room. But his legs, but his legs are stronger now, much stronger now. And, and bef shortly before I came, they said he was actually in a wheelchair for a good portion. Mm -hmm. But he's gotten stronger now. And Craig, man, he's graduated from college. He's married. He's got kids, man. He's, he's an awesome young man, godly young man. Uh, very proud of him. I know Sanford would be proud as well. Uh, I hopefully Sanford will get to watch this. I'm bragging on his son. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, Craig was a joy to teach. Uh, very talented. He could play the guitar as well. Sometimes I forget about Craig uh, playing that guitar because we had Isaac and, and Andrew who were super accomplished guitarists. But anyway, um, moving on, what do we take from these verses? Three things I noted. We can know that Jesus is seeing the entire situation and not just what we think is being presented right before his eyes. Uh, Jesus alone can forgive sins because all power in heaven and on earth has been given to him for our redemption. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus has the power to change not only the heart spiritually, but the body physically. And we talked about that as well. Um, and then finally, uh, verses 25 through 26. I don't know how long this is. Brother Ernie said he tries his best to keep it at 30 minutes. Uh, and I'm trying to do the same. Um, praise offered, verses 25 and 26. Uh, a few key words. It says, immediately he got up before them picked up what he, he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. That's the CSB. Um, King James, immediately he rose before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house glorifying God. So immediately, when Jesus gives us a clear command, we are to obey without hesitancy. Mm -hmm. And almost every command is in the word of God. So if God has proclaimed that a disciple is to do this or to do that, without mm -hmm. hesitancy, we should obey. If it's in the word of God and it tells us we should do it, we should do it. Yeah, I think he's really just saying obedience means now. Yeah, that's not right. Not after I have to argue with you. That's right. I'm not being obedient if I have to argue with you. No, if I have to, if I have to validate my command yeah. by talking you into it, that's not obedience. No. Uh, we, Find me one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when we... Uh, when we when we were raised when the kids were much younger now it's you know she's my daughter's 17 Brogan's 18 he'll be 19 this month but um you know we'd say slow obedience is disobedience exactly mm -hmm. yeah and see God you know when it says immediately he got it before them both of these say that King James and CSB both of them there's no deviation between that immediately mm -hmm. and I think that's a statement to us as individuals uh, individual believers that we immediately should obey. Well, you know, I worked in the medical field for many, many years as a trauma nurse. And one of our, our favorite phrases was ASAP. ASAP, you yeah. Know, as soon as possible, but mm -hmm. that meant now. Yeah, ASAP means now. That meant now, you know, and all. it needed to be a task that was done now. Right. Not when you got around to it. Not when it is possible, because right now it's possible. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that. Needs to be done. And then glorifying God, which is something we should all do. It says he went home glorifying God. We should give glory and praise where it is due when we have victories in this life. All good things come down from the Father of light. So we know that joy should be in response to God's goodness. And I believe I could not fathom the joy that was in the heart of this man. Uh, upon receiving the ability to walk. I mean, could you imagine now he could probably, where before he could not, and we don't know if he was stricken by palsy his whole life, I'd have to go back and read some more, or if it was something that came upon later in life. Uh, usually palsy is something that comes on later, but being a paralytic could have come at birth, we don't know for sure. But uh, if, if it was something that come on later, he knew what it was like to be able to supply for his family, and now he had 
I mean, no man wants to be, well, just about all men want to be able to physically supply for their family. And for him now, God didn't, God didn't just meet his need to, to show out and say, I'm God. God met his need so that he may be glorified in all aspects of his life. I think that's something good for us to think about and to, and to how we should uh, respond to God's goodness. It says, then everyone, verse 26, uh, in the King James says, and they were all amazed. Everyone was amazed. Uh, it is hard to ignore something as powerful as was seen that day. Our hope is to see God change people just as dramatically through salvation. Um, we should be just as amazed and overjoyed, not that God could not do it, but the fact that we were present to be able to see it. You know, um, we should never doubt the power of God. But I want to tell you, when God does reveal his power and we're in that presence, it's astounding and amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that everybody there could not. The Pharisees could not ignore it. Nobody could ignore it. They could not say, this ain't real. We saw him lower down. We saw Jesus speak to him. We saw his legs, as you were talking about, kind of like the, the Valley of Dry Bones, where the sinews and the muscles and the tendons all came on the bones. This guy's laying there with with probably atrophied legs his muscles were weak and skinny and and he Jesus says pick up your bed and walk and immediately he, he arises picks up his bed and departs from them and goes home glorifying God I mean that they could not they could not debate that especially when they had to move out the way so we could get out of the room <laughs> that's impressive what you think about that brother Terry I agree <laughs> <laughs> I think I think uh if we saw something like that, how, how could you not be a believer? I think it would be harder to be an unbeliever than to be a believer at that time. It'd take more faith to not believe than, than the faith to believe. So in conclusion, the three things that we should take from this now uh, is that Jesus offers hope to those who seek him. Jesus forgives all who come to him in faith. And believers should praise God for his forgiveness of sin. <clears throat> now, that's what they put in the, in the Sunday school lesson. I may, you know, as I teach, I may come up with something a little slightly different. And listen, when I give you these things, you know, Brother Ernie's probably said this, but I'll say it too. These are, especially like, what do we take from these verses? These are things that I found that we take from it. And, you know, some of this stuff is from the commentaries and some of this stuff is just my perspective. Um, so I hope, I hope, you know, you know, take it and, and modify it as you see fit, uh, to teach because like a lot of times the, um, the congregation, the crowd, the participants that you're speaking to helps to determine how you deliver or to what, you know, uh, the application that may be applied there. You know, I would teach this. Sim, I mean, it would be similar. There'd be similarities between how I teach the students and how I would preach this on Sunday morning. And there's a difference between teaching it the youth on Wednesday night as a sermon and then teaching it as a Sunday school on Sunday morning and then preaching it. Although they're all going to carry the same thread of truth through it, it's going to look a little different. So for each class, you know, we'd have to, you know, uh, modify that just slightly. 